Welcome to our lecture on documenting sources. Um, this lecture is not about me, you know, reading to you a reference list of example, you know, an example reference list and saying, and this is what a book citation looks like in MLA format. Um, this lecture is about helping you understand how to use citations, why to use citations, and moreover, how they kind of can create meaning in a text, how we can leverage them as writers to enhance what we're doing um, and use them meaningfully. So, um, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to bombard you with, and here's an example of this, where we're going to talk about how they can be really useful. And one way I like to think of this is kind of, they have a rhetoric. There's a rhetoric of citations, a hidden meaning behind citations. So here's kind of how I see the logic of citations working. You have the citation itself within the body of your text. That points to a reference at the end of your document, right, which will be in a, you know, that can appear as a bibliography, a work cited, a list of references, depending on the style. Um, and then that reference points you towards a source. So sources can be cited in two ways. That citation can, can look uh, in one of two ways. The first is we can use formal citations. So those are the kinds of things that get laid out in style guides. For instance, MLA uses parenthetical citations with the author's last name and the page number, if, if um, applicable, within at the end of a sentence, usually. Um, APA also uses parenthetical. Chicago uses footnotes. Um, other, uh, you know, if some, if some of you come from the sciences, sometimes scientific um, uh, citation styles, like uh, there's engineering styles that use numbers within brackets. Um, so those are formal citations, um, and you can look, and I encourage you to look up just refresh your memory on how to use uh, the formal citations for your style guide of choice. Um, the second way though that we can cite sources uh, within our text is to use what are called attributive tags, phrases within the body of the text itself that show a reader where the information came from. And one reason I like attributive tags, and you can Google, if you Google attributive tag, you'll get handouts with lists of attributive tags, you know, according to um, so-and-so argues, so-and-so states, examines, right? So we get, um, actually, there's a whole list of verbs here at the end of this handout that I have linked on uh, the YouTube um, in the description for this YouTube video. Um, so you see here that there's a lot of useful uh, verbs you can use. But one reason I like attributive tags is they can also help us to create meaning in the text. They can help us to say more about how the reader should read and interpret the text where the quote quote or you know information that we're citing that we're presenting them with so here's some examples um, right you see here um, the first two columns kind of list like the type of tag and the reason you might use it and then there's an example here in the third column um, sometimes you want to enhance the credentials of the author um, because that might make them appear more or less authoritative right so john smith a famed literary critic or a literary critic with no background in psychology, nonetheless, he's trying to claim such and such. Um, now, obviously, you don't wanna to go to too much of an extreme here and appear overly biased for your reader. You wanna do this responsibly. But you can see how this is useful, um, even kind of in a more neutral way. Like, let's say um, you want someone to understand that what you're citing is kind of old. Um, that's kind of some context or background about the material that you think is important for your reader to fully grasp what you're bringing in and what kind of information you're bringing in. So you might write something like this. In his first new book written after the tragic death of his mother in 1975, John Smith proclaimed, right? Sometimes the context helps them to understand more about what you're about to quote or paraphrase or summarize. Um, usually I would recommend that this kind of thing happens at the beginning of a sentence, like this example. I think it can sometimes be jarring to be hit with um, a quote at the beginning of a sentence without introducing it first, like this last example. Um, but you can see here some examples of how to place an attributive tag within a sentence. Um, and note that all three of these examples would be perfectly you know, acceptable in terms of indicating to a reader where your information came from. They can still go to the reference list after they read the sentence if they want to know more to find out more about Michael Carnock and what kind of source this is and where they can find it. So any one of these kind of works works in that way. Um, so that's a um, useful strategy to have. Um, so we talked about citations. References um, 
the goal of a reference is to be able to point your reader towards the version you used and where they can find it. Um, and also to kind of help them understand more about it. Is this a book? Is this a website? Um, you know, sometimes just knowing what kind of source can help somebody to interpret um, the kind of information you're bringing in. You know, if it's from a book, then someone knows that this is from a source that went really far into depth and detail about um, the topic at hand. If it's from a blog posting, they know it's something that someone wrote pretty quickly. Um, you know, and, and you can find blog posts that are really authoritative, but nonetheless, you know, it's different than a book. Um, so knowing more about the source can help someone to know more about like how to interpret what you've given them or to find it themselves. And especially with electronic sources, sometimes those things change and update and it's helpful to know what version, you know, they looked at. When was this published? Um, citations, you know, in, in the end, basically can help you as a writer to appear credible and authoritative for your readers. And it's also important for, for uh, delineating whose ideas and visuals and data are whose. And this is not only important because you're borrowing stuff, but also because it helps give you some credit as a writer, because if you're making clear what's borrowed, then the stuff that you're bringing in and arguing is also becoming clear as well. Um, and that can, you know, kind of show what you're bringing to the table that's new. So different, as you may know, right, there's different style guides used within different communities. And there are differences among those style guides, and a lot of them just reflect the goals and values of that community. Um, so uh, MLA uh, is used in the humanities, for instance, in literature, um, and it emphasizes the author, which makes a lot of sense when you think about it being a field like literature where you're talking about the contributions of an author. Um, author comes first and then the title of the work when you look at the reference and the reference lists, whereas in APA, which is used by the sciences, timeliness gets emphasized there. The year is what comes directly after the author. Um, it's also kind of... This, to me, emphasizes objectivity a little bit. Um, in APA, you, you you spell out in whole, uh, you write out in whole the author's last name, and then you use abbreviations instead of spelling, instead of writing out the whole first name. Um, it makes it gender neutral. It um, kind of maybe possibly eliminates some kind of bias that might come up along, along ethnic or racial lines. Um, so it's interesting when you break down what are some of the features of these different style guides and what they're and how they're different, how they kind of start to reflect the goals of those communities that use them. Um, style guides, if you so if you were to go, you know, open up the APA style guide or the MLA style guide, or go to the Purdue Owl website to look up how to use Chicago. Um, you'll see instructions for doing a few things. One, you know, is those in-text citations like we've talked about um, that are formal, you know, in parentheses and footnotes, brackets, whatever. The second is how to format and uh, entries in the reference lists and the list of references itself. Um, is it alphabetized? Is it numbered according to, you know, where it's placed in the text? Um, the third thing that a style guide will tell you is how to format or design the document itself. Um, you'll notice that, you know, APA, for instance, has a pretty strict format in terms of um, sections that kind of come in a paper, um, how to structure headings. Um, headings are used very often in APA papers. Um, you know, it's like introduction and background and then methods and then data and results. Um, and those each have headings that are formatted in particular ways to break up those sections. Um, and last, a style guide can also tell you uh, how to handle editorial decisions. For instance, um, in APA format, there are pretty uh, specific guidelines to help writers know when to use numerals and when to spell out numbers. Um, MLA, APA, Chicago, like I said, there are others. There are countless you know, styles, I recommend um, for the ethnographic research project using APA or MLA format. Um, APA might be easiest to use, but you can kind of take a look, you know, briefly at those on the Purdue Owl or, you know, at a style guide you have on your shelf and kind of get a sense for what you might find uh, best suited to your needs. When should you cite a source? Um, you should cite any information that comes from another writer, it's an idea, it's a fact, so even if it's not their words, but it's their idea or information. You should cite, um, obviously, when you quote or use the words from other writers, 
You should also um, attribute sources when you're using visuals or data from other writers. Um, and also be clear about where your primary research data comes from, you know, kind of attributive tag kinds of stuff like, you know, um, one participant whom I'm, it, whom I interviewed said, right, that kind of uh, phrasing can just help to make clear for your readers where information is coming from. Um, there are three basic ways to incorporate information from other writers into your writing itself, um, quotation, paraphrase, and summary. So um, here's the basic differences between them. Quotations are verbatim, the exact word someone was using. Um, paraphrase means that it's, the, it's another author's ideas, but it's put into your words. You might retain one or two key words, but you are rewriting it in your own words, and it's kind of about equal length. Like usually, um, you know, you're paraphrasing something that's a few sentences long. Your rewrite is, you know, also a few sentences long. Um, could be a little shorter, but generally about the same. And a summary is you're taking, you know, usually kind of something as a whole, either a section as a whole or a whole document as a whole, and summarizing the main ideas, distilling it down into your words, and it's going to be much, much shorter. Um, you should always make clear where these begin and end. So by that I mean if you start to summarize a source, um, often, you know, writers... They usually remember to cite it in like the first sentence, but then the summary keeps continuing, but it kind of gets ambiguous for the reader. Where is this still a summary of someone else's work? So even just, you know, stuff like she also says, she continues, she also states, stuff like that kind of throughout a paragraph just makes it super clear for a reader where the summary is beginning and ending. You can also kind of use like a sandwich method where you open with an attributive tag and end with a um, parenthetical or, you know, footnote citation at the end of like a section that's a summary, for instance. Um, quotations should be used sparingly and incorporated smoothly into the text. And by sparingly, I don't just mean, you know, you, you don't want a paper to be totally quotes, but you also just want to try to um, use only the really important, juiciest part of the quotes that you do bring in. You can sometimes quote just a single word or a couple of words, but then make the rest of it a paraphrase. Um, quotation really should be reserved for when you just truly need really powerful words, words from another person, or you're trying to represent someone else's thought process and you don't want to like put words into their own mouth. Um, you can use tools like ellipses and also brackets to help you to quote sparingly and also incorporate them smoothly into a sentence. So ellipses can, you know, those three periods in a row can be used where you're deleting information from a quotation and brackets can be used around words that you're adding to a quotation. Usually you only add words to a quotation if you need to clarify something. Um, you know, you don't know if someone will know who somebody is or what something means. Um, or if you're trying to just kind of make small changes to the grammar, like you need the word is in there to make the quote fit with the rest of the sentence. You would use brackets in that kind of situation. And then last, paraphrases and summaries should preserve an author's intent as much as possible. Um, it's not possible to be 100% objective and that's okay. You're always gonna have a viewpoint as a reader and everyone will read a text differently and have their own view of what it said. Nonetheless, you wanna try as much as possible when paraphrasing or summarizing someone else's work to give as much justice to what you think they were trying to communicate. Now the mechanics of documenting sources. Um, so you wanna know your reference styles format for in-text citations and reference entries. Um, APA is author comma year. Um, and then it's an alphabetized reference list with different formats for different sources. And you can look, um, you know, again, in some kind of style guide or um, an online source. I keep mentioning the Purdue Al because I think it's a really authoritative one and it's updated frequently. Um, you can use those sources to, you know, look for, you know, what the formats look like for different sources as well as exceptions, things like I can't find an author, what do I do? Um, you can also, uh, another, uh, you know, you can um, plug and chug as I call it. So find the format for different sources and then stick stuff in the blanks of the template that you're referencing. Or you can use a generator and I'll talk more about, more about those in a minute. If you do generate your sources online or through a program, you absolutely need to check them because they're always rife with error. 
Um, I use them myself in my research. They're great tools, but they always make mistakes. So you still have to check them even if you're not creating them from scratch yourself. Um, and then last, uh, this kind of goes back to the rhetoric and citations again. You need to think about your audience and your purpose um, when you place citations in a document. Where is this citation going to make the most sense to readers? Where is it going to be the least intrusive in, the, in their flow of reading? How can I most clearly delineate ideas within this sentence or paragraph? Those are the kinds of questions you need to ask yourself when placing a citation. So here are a few uh, software-based citations um, that I, uh, I have used Zotero. Um, it's free and open source. Um, I, I would say probably it's um, you're going to have a bigger learning curve. It's going to take more time and energy to set up something software based. So I'll go over these quickly. But unless you are trying to establish like more of a long term bibliography, or unless you know you see yourself doing more research in the future, you know maybe you're in a program where you're going to have a major senior research project and you'd like to just kind of go into that having some familiarity with a software program that handles bibliographies and citations, um, or you know you might want to go to like graduate school or something like that, um, then maybe software-based citation management's for you. Otherwise, hang tight. I'll talk about online uh, versions in a minute. Um, but Zotero is free. Um, it's also open source. Um, it gets updated. It's uh, pretty intuitive to use. I like it. It um, integrates right into your browser. Um, I'll show you an example, actually. So here in my browser, um, this here is the Zotero button, um, and if I, cl you can see if I mouse over it, um, it gives me the option to save a source that I'm looking at in my browser directly into Zotero. It'll import the information I need. You can also do this, go to like the Amazon page or the Google Books page of a book. It'll um, take the bibliographic, bibliographic information for the book you're looking at. Um, so that kind of stuff is nice. Um, Mendeley, I haven't used myself. My partner actually uses it, um, and he loves it. Um, it's also free. EndNote costs money. It can be pretty expensive. Um, there is a discount at the UC bookstore on it, um, but you know, definitely don't go spending money on this stuff unless there's a reason. Um, one nice thing about these three, and there's others, but these are the three I'm highlighting. One nice thing about these three programs is you can share your bibliography um, on the cloud with other collaborators or researchers. Um, so, you know, sometimes if you collaborate with someone who uses one or the other, they might kind of ask you to use it. Um, Microsoft Word also has a tool that allows you to create bibliographies directly from Microsoft Word. I haven't used it myself, so I don't know how clunky it is or how well it works, um, but that's an option you could look into as well. Um, Online citation managers include things like BibMe, Citation Machine, EasyBib, and NightSite. And actually, I'm going to jump back to the browser. Um, this will be uh, listed in the description as well. But this is a library guide from the University of Kansas that goes through um, these four or five uh, different online citation managers and gives you a rundown of the different uh, features they have, um, what they do. Some of them allow you to kind of, you know, keep a create an account and keep a running list of sources. Some of them are more just like a once and done, you know, you copy and paste it into your paper and then it's all done. Um, but those are available as well and also worth looking into. Again, I just want to reiterate for a millionth time. So I use Zotero in my own research. These are great tools, but they will always make mistakes. So you just still need to check out, check the output against uh, something from, you know, some kind of reference. So anyway, um, thanks for listening and I hope you found this helpful.